Welcome to another deep dive. We've got a whole stack of research articles and reports about open science this time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And it seems like our listeners are really curious about why this movement to make science more transparent and all that hasn't really taken off the way some people expected. Well, yeah, it's kind of like um, it's one of those things that's easier said than done. You know, like yeah. we all know we should be eating healthy and exercising. Oh, yeah. But then sometimes that extra cookie is just too tempting. Exactly. And it looks like it's the same thing with open science. Right. There's a big gap between like knowing what the best practices are for good science and actually like consistently doing them in the real world. Right. That makes sense. So, OK, let's talk about some of these uh, roadblocks. My sources keep mentioning something called questionable research practices. Oh, yeah. QRPs. QRPs, yeah. What exactly are those? So imagine you have a scientist and they're doing a bunch of experiments, right? Okay. But they only publish the ones that, you know, worked, quote unquote. The ones that got the results they wanted. Yeah, exactly. And they just kind of sweep all the other experiments, the ones that didn't really get exciting results under the rug. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what QRPs are. Okay, so like selectively choosing what you show. Yeah, Things like that, selectively reporting your data, tweaking your hypotheses after you've already seen the data, or even just not being super clear about how you analyze the data. All those things can really distort what the data actually says. So it's like you're only showing the highlight reel of your research? Exactly. But not like the full unedited version. Yeah, and the problem is if enough researchers do this, then it starts to make the whole research literature kind of untrustworthy, right? Yeah. It makes it's like it. you're trying to build a house, but the foundation is full of cracks. Ooh, that's a scary <laughs> thought. Okay, but researchers know this, right? They do, yeah. Like, this one paper you sent actually points out that researchers themselves have proposed a ton of solutions to combat these QRPs. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's not like they're unaware. Right. But there's that disconnect again, you know, <laughs> between, like, knowing the best practices and actually doing them. Yeah. Okay. So knowing is only half the battle. Exactly. Okay. Well, let's talk solutions then. You've got like 10 practical recommendations here for closing this gap. Yes. And they're aimed at both individual researchers and like the whole scientific ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So what are some that really stand out to you? Well, I think a really cool one is pre-registration of studies. Okay. I've heard of that, but explain yeah. it. Yeah. So imagine this. Before you even collect any data, okay. you go online, you like register your research plan, right? Okay. Like, what are your hypotheses? How are you going to analyze the data? Basically everything. So it's like a timestamp? Exactly. It's like yeah. setting a contract with yourself, but like publicly. So you can't change the goalposts later. Exactly. No matter what your data ends up looking like, you've got to stick to that original plan. Oh, that's clever. It adds a whole other level of transparency and accountability to the research process. Right. I see how that could help. What else? Okay, this one is kind of revolutionary. Okay. It's called registered reports, and it, like, totally flips the traditional publishing process on its head. Oh, that sounds interesting. So traditionally how it works is, like, journals will decide whether to publish a paper based on the results, right? Like, did the study find something super exciting? Right. If it's not exciting, it might not be published. Yeah, and that creates a lot of pressure to, like, only submit papers with really flashy findings. Right. But with registered reports, you submit your research plan for review before you even collect the data. Wow. Okay. So the journal decides if your idea is good. Yeah. They look at the research question and the methods, and if they think it's worthwhile, then they commit to publishing it no matter what the results are. Even if the results are kind of boring, it still gets published. Exactly. So it takes away that pressure to only have exciting findings. Wow, that's such a different way of looking at it. And it lets researchers just focus on doing really rigorous science without worrying about whether the outcome is going to be like a hit or not. I like. Yeah, it's a game changer for sure. Well, we've covered a lot already, so I think we should pause here. Yeah, good idea. And we can come back and dive into some more of these solutions in part two of our deep dive. Sounds good. We'll be back soon to explore more ways to close this gap in open science. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to our deep dive on open science. Hmm. Last time we were talking about some pretty interesting solutions for making science more transparent. Yeah, like pre-registration and registered reports. Exactly. Yeah. Those were really eye-opening for me, but we still have a bunch more recommendations to go through, right? We do. And this next one is kind of a biggie, mandatory data and code sharing. Okay, yeah, I remember that one from the sources. Why is that so important? Okay, imagine you're a chef and you come up with like an amazing new dish, right? Yeah. Wouldn't you want other chefs to be able to try it out, see how they can make it even better? I see what you're getting at. So in science, 
Sharing your data and code is kind of like sharing that recipe. It lets other people verify your findings, build on your work, maybe even catch a mistake you didn't see. This is about collaboration and transparency. Exactly. Plus, it helps prevent things like, uh, what's it called? Packing. P-hacking. Yeah, I've heard of that. It's basically when you, like, keep trying different statistical analyses until you get a significant result, even if it's just by chance. Oh, so it's not really a true result. Right. And if everyone is sharing their data, it's harder to get away with that kind of thing. Right. It's like having a second set of eyes on everything. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So next up, we have Open Science Awards and Badges. Oh, I like this one. Tell me more. It's basically like giving out gold stars for good scientific citizenship. Uh-huh. Love that. So, you know, researchers who are going above and beyond to make their work open and accessible would get recognition. Okay, that makes sense. It sends a message that these practices are valuable, and it might even encourage others to do the same, you know? Yeah, incentives always help. Exactly. And it's not just individual researchers who need to change, right? It's like the whole system needs to evolve. So the institutions, too. Yeah. So that leads us to the next few recommendations, which are all about how journals, funders, and professional organizations can step up their open science game. Okay, so who's first? Well, funding agencies have a lot of power, right? So one recommendation is for them to make open science practices a requirement for getting grant money. Ah, so you got to follow the rules if you want the funding. Exactly. And that would have a huge ripple effect because funding is like the lifeblood of research. Right. It makes sense. Yeah. But just making people do it doesn't mean they'll know how to do it properly, right? That's a great point. And that's where the next recommendation comes in. Open science training. Okay, so teaching researchers the best practices. Exactly. It could be workshops, online resources, mentorship, whatever, helps them actually put these open science practices into action. So like a roadmap for doing good science. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, what about the people who review and publish the research? Oh, yeah. That's an important part of the process, too. Right. So they need training, too. Reviewers and editors need to know how to assess, like, the rigor and transparency of a study so they can make good recommendations about what should be published. Right. So everyone is on the same page. That's the goal. And the final recommendation is less about specific actions and more about, like, a shift in values. Oh, interesting. What do you mean? Well, right now there's this huge emphasis on publishing, you know, positive findings. The big breakthroughs and discoveries. Exactly. Yeah. And that leads to publication bias, where studies that don't find a clear answer just never see the light of day. Ah, uh, because they're not exciting enough. Exactly. So this recommendation is about promoting a culture that values null results, messy findings, even the stuff that doesn't fit neatly into a story. It's about embracing the whole process of science, even the parts that aren't glamorous. Yeah, because even studies that don't find an answer can still teach us something valuable. I like that. But so far, we've only been talking about researchers and institutions. Yeah. What about the rest of us? That's a great point, and that's exactly where we're headed in part three. Welcome back to our deep dive. Yeah. We're on the final part of our exploration of open science. It's amazing how all these recommendations connect, isn't it? Like from pre-registration to data sharing to like changing the whole culture of science. Yeah, it really seems like changing things for the better requires looking at the whole picture. Absolutely. But, you know, we've been mostly talking about scientists as institutions so far. Yeah. What about everyone else? Like what role does the public have in all of this open science stuff? That is such a good question. You know, we're all consumers of science, whether we realize it or not. Sure. Like, think about the news you read or the health choices you make or even the policies you support, right? Science is, like, woven into pretty much every part of our lives. So even if we're not scientists, what happens in science affects us. Exactly. And that means we have a responsibility to be, like savvy consumers of scientific information. Okay, I like that. So how do we become more savvy? Where do we even start? Well, a good place to start is by being critical. Okay. Don't just take things at face value, even if they sound really convincing or they're coming from someone who seems like an expert, right? Question everything. Kind of, yeah. Like, always ask yourself, what's the evidence for this claim? Who funded the research? Has it been replicated by other scientists? So do a little detective work. Yeah. Like, look for those clues that show transparency and rigor. 
So like, was the study pre-registered? Did they share their data and code? Exactly. Those are all really good signs. It seems like these recommendations can really help people evaluate science, which is cool. It totally can. But honestly, sometimes I feel like I just don't have time to like deeply analyze every single study I come across. I totally get that. It can feel overwhelming. Yeah. And that's where good science communication comes in, right? Like we need to support organizations and journalists who are really committed to reporting on science accurately and responsibly. So find sources we can trust. Exactly. And if you see something that seems like off or misleading, don't be afraid to call it out. You know, we can hold those communicators accountable for being transparent and accurate. So we have a part to play in shaping how science is communicated. We absolutely do. Okay, what else can we do to help promote open science? Well, another big thing is advocating for open access publishing. Right. That's where the findings are free for anyone to read, not stuck behind some paywall. Exactly. Open access makes sure that everyone can benefit from scientific knowledge, no matter their background or their resources. But how can we support that? Like, do I need to start donating to journals or something? You can definitely do that. But a really simple thing is to just, like, choose to read and share research that's published open access, right? You can also advocate for policies that support open access. Like at universities or even in the government. Right. So use your voice, make conscious choices, help build a more open and fair system. I'm really seeing how this isn't just about scientists. It's about all of us. It really is. Well, thank you so much for taking us on this deep dive into open science. Oh, of course. It was my pleasure. I feel like I have a much better grasp on this movement now. It's been great talking about this with you. It's been really interesting, and I hope our listeners feel the same. And remember... Keep asking those questions, keep learning, and keep pushing for a more open and trustworthy world of science. Absolutely. Open science is for everyone. Well said. Thanks for joining us.